Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in once again to Authentic. Uh, I'm sorry. Hold on. What is going on here? Okay. <laughs> oh, this is clearly acting crazy. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in once again to Queen Amadai TV Presents True Crime. So let me go ahead and put this banner up. Okay. I don't know what's going on with this live chat. So anyway, let's get ready to get into it. Okay, so this first story I'm gonna, well, this story I'm gonna be talking about because I'm going live also. Hey, Millie, hey, Jeff ATL. I'm gonna be going live on the Paranormal Channel after this. So this story is about a six-year-old child by the name of Christopher Barrios. Uh, that was killed by a pedophile. This happened like a decade or so ago. Hold on just a moment. Where are my receipts? They changed the time of the video to 10. Oh, okay. Okay, that's why nobody was in here. Okay, see how they do? These are the games they play. I hope you all screenshotted that. I hope you all screen screenshotted that. I was wondering why nobody was in the chat. So that's what they're doing. Okay, that's cool. To 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. But see, when I look at it, because I always go back and check. Hold on, let me post something real quick, people. Hold on for just a moment. Because I'm gonna now, I'm glad you told me that. So now I'm going to have to go on YouTube on this channel and post something. Uh, so that everybody knows that I'm live now. Okay, give me just a second to put this post up, people. Okay. I'm so glad you all told me that because they play so many games. That's that's how you know the hate is real. Okay. Let me also go on Twitter real quick and post it. Then it asks to set reminders. Right. This is what they do. They are such haters. That's okay. That's okay. Let me go here and post it on Twitter. Okay, hold on a second. Now let me put the link on here. Now let me go ahead and add the link on Twitter. Hold on, people. Hold on. I'll be done in just a second. Let me share this link to the video because the devils are clearly busy. Oh, you know what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, people.
Okay, just one more change, people. Just one more change. Okay. All right. I'm done. There we go. Okay. So you have to count. You have to. It's sad that you have to counteract everything they do because this is what they do. These are the games they play, people. Okay. So I'm so glad you all figured out that they lied about the time, right? But don't worry because I'm going to be um, getting one of those numbers so you can text and get your uh, notifications because they don't give out the notifications and they switch up the times. So I'm going to be doing stuff to counter that. Just got my alert. YouTube is lame. Yes, beloved. Let me tell you something. They changed the time to 10 p.m. That's what people are telling me. They changed the time from 11 from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. So clearly they don't want people in the chat or viewing my videos. And the funny thing is this channel doesn't even have anything to do with white supremacy. So that's how they hate. Clearly trying to sabotage. But that's okay because they will be in court. Like I told you all. And I, for one, cannot wait. Okay, so let me go ahead and pull up these receipts. Because today I'm going to be talking about a six-year-old child by the name of Christopher Barrios, who over a decade ago was killed by some racist devils. They uh, molested him, raped him first, and then they killed him. Mind you, the person who did this had already been charged with uh, molest molestation. Okay? But they didn't really do anything about it. They just gave him probation. Go figure. Okay, so I'm going to need my glasses for this because this print is kind of small. So let's go ahead and get into it, people. I do apologize for the uh, delays, all right? Okay, Christopher, De uh, Cri um, I'm sorry, George, David, and Peggy Edenfield were accused, they were all accused, and this is family members, right? They were all accused of Christopher's abduction and murder. And then a fourth person by the name of Donald Dale, who originally was charged with tampering with evidence and concealing the body, has since pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of lying to the police. Now, the Superior Court Judge Stephen Scarlett accepted the plea and transferred Dale to a mental health facility. I want y'all to pay attention to how they tried to say these white folks who killed this little child was uh, were mentally ill. Please pay attention. Okay, so he was sent to a mental health facility and banished. They banished him from Glenn County. Now, Peggy Edenfield testified in the case against her husband, David, and has also she also agreed to testify against her son, George, during his trial. In exchange for her testimony, she would not be placed on the death penalty or would not receive the death penalty. Okay, so... <clears throat> Now, just to give you some up, uh, just just to give you some uh, information on the person who initiated this whole thing, right? A racist devil and pedophile by the name of David Edenfield. He was charged in 1994, first of all, for committing incest with his own daughter, and he pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 10 years probation, not prison. George Edenfield was convicted of two counts of child molestation and given probation in May of 1997. In September of 2006, he was then indicted for violating his probation by living less than 1,000 feet from a park in downtown Brunswick and was ordered to move. And on March the 5th, 2007, days before Christopher was abducted, Edenfield was sentenced to 10 years probation again. A state law banning convicted sex offenders from living within a thousand feet of parks, playgrounds, child care facilities, schools, churches, swimming pools, and school bus stops was then passed in 2006. Now, however, the school bus stop provision was blocked by a federal judge pending his decision in a suit claiming this provision would be unconstitutional. George Edenfield and his family lived just within just a few feet of a school bus stop of Christopher and they regularly used uh, the school that Christopher regularly used to go to, okay? So they lived close to his bus stop at, at the end of the day. Now, let's talk about what these devils did. 
and how they um you see here's the thing if this person had actually been put in prison where he belonged in the first place after he molested in his own child he wouldn't have been out to do this but it's funny that they will put people in prison for selling drugs right or for doing minuscule things but pedophiles who are some of the most heinous wicked satanic devilish people who clearly don't need not walk free ever instead of putting them in prison for life they put them back on the streets to rape other people's children that's how you know that many of these devils if not most of them are pedophiles okay now jurors watched intensely during the um during the recording of david Edensfield's confessing that he sexually assaulted and then choked six-year-old Christopher Michael Barrios Jr. He choked him to death. Now, on the recording, Edenfield is seen being calm as he describes the killing. And he said that it was exciting. And he says that he acted instinctively to kill the child. Now, as in the opening of his death penalty murder trial, Edenfield, who was 61 at the time, showed absolutely no emotion as he watched himself dispassionately describe how he and his 34 year old son george edenfield killed the little kindergartner who begged them to stop the boy was killed after he threatened to tell his father and grandmother that the edenfields had molested him david edenfield told a glenn county police detective that the 21 and a half uh the 21 and a half hour interview he, or he reported this information during a 21 and a half hour interview. Now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This print is so small, it's hard to read. It says two and a half hour interview. Now, David and George Edenfield, who were both convicted and were previously convicted child molesters, right? They were charged. Peggy, David's wife, and George's mother were neighbors of Christopher and his extended family in a canal mobile home park on Horseshoe Lane. Now, all three were charged with molesting and murdering the boy. The district attorney, Stephen Kelly, was seeking the death penalty against all of them except for Peggy Edenfield. Okay, David Edenfield was the first one of them to stand trial. So let me tell you what happened, because this is basically talking about the trial. Let me tell you what happened. So Christopher was on his way home from school, six years old, mind you. He was walking to his grandmother's house. So David Edenfield was outside on his front porch and he saw him walking home. He then lured Christopher, lured Christopher over to his apartment or over to his house. And once he got him there, him and his son, who was 34 years old at the time, they both raped him, sodomized him, right? Now, mind you, because George had been, uh, or David had been charged with this before, he felt that, okay, this time I'm not gonna leave any witnesses. Let him get mental help in prison. Absolutely. But see, here's the thing. They don't want to give these people prison time very often. They don't want to give them prison time. So they will often lie and say that the person was mentally incompetent. And that's exactly what they did. They said that he was mentally incompetent and pay attention. The other person who was also involved in this that helped them uh, hide the body, <clears throat> they said that he too was incompetent. So they want us to think that these people were crazy right this is what they want us to think and you know they said that he actually suffered such a horrible death such a horrible death and as i'm sure he did so the prosecutors wasted little time on the first day of the trial for david edenfield in detailing the horrific manner in which they killed six-year-old michael christopher barrios jr and he was molested by the way this happened on march in march of 2007. now Assistant District Attorney John B. Johnson told the jurors in the opening statement how they had lured him to the home. And that's when they molested him. They said Edenfield participated in the in, in the uh, molestation and the murder of Christopher inside of the Edenfield trailer. Now, the prosecutors also said during the videotaped interrogation that Sorrow testified during the interrogation uh that edenfield and his wife peggy had taken their son george a convicted sex offender 
they had, and this is the thing. Both the father and the son were convicted sex offenders. I want y'all to pay attention to that. Okay. Now they said they had taken their son, a convicted sex offender, to the Glen County Detention Center on March the 8th, 2007, so that he could re-register as a sex offender at their new address in the Canal Road Mobile Home Park. And here's the thing, people. So the wife was complicit in it. So likely when her husband raped their child, their own daughter, she absolutely had to know about this, right? She absolutely had to know about this. So anyway, let me continue because this is all so crazy. So Christopher was last seen skipping home with a toy lightsaber in his hand, but he never made it home. When his stepmother realized that Christopher had not or was not at his grandmother's and she couldn't locate him, she contacted his father at work to help with the search. They couldn't find Christopher anywhere, and so they called the police. Now, local investigators and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation quickly organized search teams and interviewed the residents of the mobile home park. Now, one of the investigators said uh, they saw a lightsaber in the yard of a mobile home that was the path that Christopher took to go from his grandmother's home to his father's. Now, the investigator observed that the occupants behaved very suspiciously when he asked them about the toy. See, when they abducted him, after they lured him onto the property, they didn't realize he dropped his toy, that lightsaber, and the parents and the grandmother all said that he had that when he went to school. So they found it in their yard. That's how they knew that they must have had something to do with it. And then they were acting suspicious to Boots. Okay, so... The trailer park housed a number of men with a history of sex offenses, including uh, David and George Edenfield. Now, they say this case is an example of how a state's best intentions can go horribly wrong. In 2006, Georgia strengthened its laws to prevent child molesters from exploiting children on playgrounds. Specifically, child molesters were not allowed to live within a thousand feet of schools and playgrounds. Now, the Superior Court of Brunswick um, actually convicted George Edenfield in 1997 after he had molested two young boys. Now, not only did he molest, I'm sorry, that was George. The father, David, molested his own daughter. His son, George, molested two young boys in 1997. Now, the parents refused a deal of a trial and moved away. George was sentenced to 10 years probation because it would have been difficult to sentence him to prison without the boys as a witness. So the parents of these two boys, they didn't want to, you know, take their children to court. They didn't want them to have to go through the trauma, uh, the trauma, traumatization of testifying. So that's why he only got probation, I guess. But anyway, they moved away. Now, during that decade, George Edenfield lived with his parents downtown on Union Street. The house was several hundred feet from a playground, which was in clear violation of the new Georgia law. Glenn County authorities told George at the end of August that he had to leave. Why did they tell him he had to leave? Why wasn't he arrested and put in jail, put in prison? Let me tell you something. He violated the rules. So why wasn't he put in prison? But they just told him he had to leave. This is what they do. Now, his failure to do so caused his arrest in September of 2006. But clearly they should have arrested him previously. A month later, the Edenfields moved to the Canal Mobile Home Park on Horseshoe Lane where there were children of various ages, and among them was six-year-old Christopher Barrios. Now, while the 2006 Georgia law prevented sex offenders from living near these playgrounds, there were no restrictions barring child molesters from living near school bus stops. So there was a school bus stop very close to the mobile home park where the Edenfields lived. So on that Monday, March the 5th of 2007, George faced Glenn County Superior Court Judge Stephen Scarlett on the charges of living too close to a playground. He pleaded guilty and the judge sentenced him to attend additional 10 years of probation. A local official familiar with George Edenfield's case asked for a stricter form of probation, but a state official persuaded the court that it wasn't necessary, they say. They said it wasn't necessary for a pedophile to have stricter probation. He should have been in jail. Now, apparently during the 10, the 10 years of George's probation since 1997, no one had come forward with any criminal complaints against him. But three days later, on Thursday, March the 8th, shortly after 6.30 p.m., George Bar uh, Christopher Barrios was missing. Christopher lived with his father and stepmother in the mobile home park, and his grandmother lived in the same park. 
Now, the Eden Fields lived across the street from the grandmother. The path Christopher took on his way home to his grandmother's house, uh, to, from his grandmother's to his father's house, had to go past Eden Fields' trailer. The following week, investigators found Christopher's body and trash bags in a wooded area. The boy had been brutally raped anally and orally and choked to death. Filthy, disgusting pigs. They raped him anally and orally and then choked him to death. Now, one sex offender stood out as a prime suspect, George Edenfield. George's father, David Edenfield, was also an, an offender who had sexually assaulted a member of his own family. Now, the elder Edenfield admitted that he and George had lured Christopher into their home. The two men then raped and sodomized the little boy while Peggy Edenfield watched and masturbated. This is what the mother did. This is what the mother did. Who does this? The Edenfields believed that after the horrific sexual assault, their only choice of avoiding detection was to kill the child and dispose of his body. David Edenfield told authorities that as his son strangled Christopher, he put his hands over George's so that he could feel what it was like to participate in the killing. He said, Christopher was dead. I guess it was exciting for all of us. That's what David Eidenfield said. I guess it was exciting for all of us. He persuaded his friend Donald Dale to help conceal the crime by wrapping him in plastic trash bags and then lying to the police. Now, while we were in Brunswick, we decided to learn a bit more about George Edenfield. So we walked around the neighborhood he had lived in for so many years and took pictures of the house and the playground that was instrumental in his move to the mobile home park. We also stopped people on the street and knocked on the doors of homes around the area, uh, the one in which he had lived. Most of the people we spoke to either didn't know him or knew or knew him, but didn't want to talk about him. Finally, one woman reluctantly gave me an interview about what kind of person George was. And remember, George is the one who was the son, the 34-year-old. The father was 50, uh, 61. Now, from her perspective, she says there was something wrong with him. She didn't know whether he was mentally ill, develop, developmentally challenged, autistic, or a combination of those conditions. His behavior was abusive and frightening. She was terrified of him. She wouldn't even drive her car past his house after the threats that he had made to her. Okay, now one day when she was in her front yard, he came over to her with a with a pair of hedge clippers in his hand and a look of sheer hatred in his eyes. He said, I'm going to cut your bush, he said, as he opened and shut the clippers close to her abdomen. Now, he wasn't talking about the bushes in her yard, mind you. She backed away from him quickly and got inside the house and then locked the door. It wasn't the first time that he had harassed her, banging on the door with his fist and yelling obscenities. Later that day, we went to the mobile home park. And this, this mind you, I'm telling the story from the eyes of the people who went and took reports on this stuff and who visited neighbors and tried to speak with witnesses, okay? Now, he says, later that day, we went to the mobile home park to talk to the residents and to take photos um involvement that were involved in christopher's death now the people that lived there fell into two different camps when asked about george Edenfield or Edenfield. they all knew that there was something permanently wrong with him given his inexplicable burst of anger and rude behavior some of the residents felt sorry for him and his parents but others were afraid of having them uh having him live near them his parents had told the neighbors that George was fine when he took his medicine and that he was harmless. We also learned that George had stalked the, pro the uh, pro 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 I'm sorry, they also said they learned that George had stalked and propositioned two teenage boys and waited for them at the bus stop frequently in the afternoons when he came home from school or when they came home from school. They did not know that he was a convicted child molester. Now, the mother of one of the boys George, uh, one of the boys that George had propositioned, granted uh, us an interview. She said that when her husband found out, 
he was going to kill George. The caretaker of the trailer park and the boy's mother had talked the husband out of taking any action. The family had experienced some trouble with the authorities in another state and did not want it known in the park either. Now, they say they spoke to the uh, spoke to the father on the phone of a teenager that George had stalked. When the father first heard of it, he said he was he was ready to give George a good beating. Instead, he counseled his son to ignore George and not be friendly or polite to him. The father also mentioned that he didn't want any violence on his part to result in having the park owner ask his family to leave. Now, as the residents of the park learned what Edenfields, uh, Edenfields, the Edenfields had done to Christopher and the history of their sexual offenses, they were infuriated that George had been in court several days prior to the murder. The justice system had failed them. George should have been locked up for his parole violation, not just given 10 more years of probation. That's exactly what I said. This is all so crazy. They're at fault for this. The whole system is to blame. Now, if that had not happened, Christopher Barrios would still be alive. The only thing more heartbreaking than the brutal death of a six-year-old boy is the fact that it is the fact that it didn't have to happen at all. I wish I could say that the rape and murder of Christopher Barrios Jr. by a family of convicted pedophiles was an unusual case, but it's not. Many factors contributed to his death, and until these issues are addressed, children all over the country are at risk. For one thing, there are communities in which residents unfairly see law enforcement as the problem not the solution to dangerous behavior, uh, behaviors that they witness in their own neighborhoods. Now, residents recognize George Edenfield's menacing and uncontrollable behavior in downtown Brunswick and the mobile park home, but apparently no one had made a criminal complaint. Had Judge Stephen Scarlett known of George's aggressive acts, I suspect that the outcome of George's hearing on his parole violation would have been different than just 10 more years of regular probation. But in many ways, the community had failed the justice system and themselves with its silence. Now, a jury of a jury in Judge Scarlett's court convicted David Edenfield for kidnapping, murder, child molestation, and several other serious crimes, all in connection with the brutal sexual assault and death of six-year-old Christopher Barrios, and they sentenced him to death. Now, Peggy Edenfield testified against her husband and son so that she would not get the death penalty and instead received a 60-year prison sentence. Experts judge uh, experts judge George Edenfield incompetent and housed him in a state mental facility. Family friend Donald Dale acknowledged that he lied to the police and tampered with evidence to conceal the death of a person and prosecutors dropped the more serious charges and let him plead guilty of lying to police. But they also said he was mentally retarded and that it was uh, the actual, that's the actual legal terminology. They said that he served much of his sentence um, on probation in the state home of the mentally disabled outside of Glenn County. That is so crazy. That is so crazy. These people are clearly devils. Yes, absolutely. Neanderthal genes, 100%. Okay? He's incompetent because he wants to have sex with kids. What? Absolutely. Okay? And this was a whole family of pedophiles. The husband, the mother, and the son. How disgusting and sick. These people are a prime example of if the hills had eyes were people. Okay? How sick is that? Anyway, that's just real crazy. Right? The judges fell two weak-minded judges. Absolutely. Well, actually, it was the same judge. It was the same judge. Because the same judge that gave George Edensfield, Eden that gave him probation, 10 more years of probation when he violated uh, the first time, that's the same judge who tried the case. So clearly crazy. Yes, absolutely, General Overture. Demonic. Absolutely. Sick and twisted heathen, says Tamisha. Absolutely. So with that all being said, people, that's just so heinous and atrocious. And these are what you're dealing with. These people go around and molest children, do all types of nefarious things, and kill them and all of this, discard them like they're trash, and trash bags thrown out into the woods or whatever, in a mobile home park or whatever, a trailer park, no less. And they've done this numerous times before, even to their own children. 
and they get probation instead of being sent to prison for life in the first place. It's also crazy. They can't make it make sense. These are the folks that celebrated by the NAMBLA Association in D.C. And yes, absolutely. They, they are celebrated by the NAMBLA. And for those of you who don't know what NAMBLA is, it stands for National Association of, of Man, Boy, Love. Or it's the National, um, I think it's National Association Man, Boy, Love or something like that. But it's clearly for pedophiles. Clearly for pedophiles. So anyway, how they derived from caves. Absolutely. So with that all being said, people, listen, I'm going to go ahead and conclude this broadcast. I want you all to tune in to Queen Amadai TV presents Beyond the Realm because I'm doing back to back, two back to back paranormal stories that trust me, you don't want to miss. OK, so with that all being said, I want to thank you all for tuning in once again to Queen Amadai TV presents True Crimes. And I hope to see you all in the next chats.